All right, hello everyone. You're listening to Cast Bitten, a Dungeon Synth podcast, and I'm the host Trev. And I'm here for a very special episode today with my good friend Tristan back on. Tristan is the artist responsible for the incredible project Elevalon. Elevalon just released their sophomore album Drums in the Deep Wood, which, as they put it, is a multi-dimensional celebration of Scandinavia's trollish folklore. You just heard the track A Hunger to Carry Off Flocks, which is to me, that's just a wonderful way to get introduced to the album if you haven't heard it yet. It really uh, really encapsulates how exciting and dense and rhythmically interesting the album is. Uh, so yeah, welcome back to the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's an uh, absolute honor to be on again, and uh, yeah, excited to talk the new album. Oh, for sure. Yeah, this is your third time on here. That's a, a real cast bitten record. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think it might be. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll hold that place with nice. honor i guess or with pride <laughs> so uh so i was kind of looking through my notes earlier and uh, i guess the th- the thing that interests me the n- the most is comparing the process for writing this album with the process behind uh writing your first one nimway's gift because i see so many so many similarities with so many differences and, and uh nimway's gift is such a wonderful album and then there's so many ways that you've kind of uh I don't know, grown and matured from there. And uh, that's what was on my mind uh, the most preparing for this. So so I'll dive in with kind of a bigger open-ended question about that. So I hear a lot of familiar uh, voices and characters in this release, uh, as well as plenty of new ones. And there's ones that are kind of uh, not present in this that were in the first album. Uh, like to me, that big reedy instrument that you use a ton, is, it's that's just so core to what I think of as the, the Elevalon sound. And I was happy to hear that come back. But then you also have all these, uh, I don't know, didgeridoo style voices and these vocal punches, kind of the ha huh, ha, huh, a lot of that. Yeah. Can you just talk about your instrument selection process? Maybe what you wanted to bring over from the first album and what you felt comfortable leaving behind and what you felt missing uh, from this sound. What was going on there? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Hopefully I can capture all that in this uh, answer. But with the first album, you know, I wasn't really a dungeon synth artist yet while I was writing it. Um, I came into it, you know, thinking, hey, I really like this genre. I want to, quote unquote, level up my synth abilities and use those in metal. And, you know, maybe I'll make a little album here. Um, right. And so that was a very experimental process, right? I was going online, finding mostly free VSTs and figuring out what was out there and what I could do and figuring out what technical knowledge I had in Reaper that I could apply and trying to learn more and, you know, really figure it out. Um, so I was finding my sound and, you know, over the course of writing that album, I kind of honed in on a number of virtual instruments and, um, wrote a bunch of songs and got them to, you know, a point where I thought they were really cool and people might like to listen to them. Once it was polished enough, you know, I put it out. Um, With the second album, however, you have to approach it differently because it quickly becomes this kind of tightrope balancing act of, you know, what is my identity as Elevalon? Um, What does that mean? And what elements of my sound are core to that sound? And for me, anyways, um, I love when albums that an artist put out uh, puts out are thematic and unique, right? Um, I love when an artist has a first album and it, you know, kind of feels like it occupies a certain maybe metaphysical space in your head and you know what it represents and what sounds are there and how that all kind of ties together. And then they release another album. I don't want it to really necessarily be the same thing. Um, you sure, know, I'd like yeah. it to explore maybe different ideas but you still want the core of that artist to be there and so with albums that i write um you know generally for me it comes from a conceptual idea that i have where i'm like ooh, you know that's something that i would love to hear that's a vibe or a you know an idea that would really stand out to me in in an audio format and so for me it was this idea of like venturing deep into these dark dense woods and you know encountering um some of the the creatures of folklore that i heard a lot about as a kid and really grew to love the stories about and uh you know maybe they're having some sort of strange and mysterious and not particularly well understood ritual or 
gathering <laughs> festival, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, this idea came to me when I was on a hike up in some really deep woods in uh, northern Michigan. Everything was covered in moss and, you know, you're kind of looking at rocks and thinking, wow, you know, and all those like Nordic tales about trolls and things <laughs> with the moss on this rocket, you know, it could be like some big humanoid. Just might be. Yeah, buried in that <laughs> hillside. There could be a gnomes and trolls and fairies under every, you know, moss covered log and stone and tree root. Um, and so, you know, I kind of had that idea and I was like, well, that could really be something that translates well into, um, into dungeon synth. And so I, I kind of looked at the core elements of my sound and thought, well, what's unique to Elevalon and what should I keep and what's unique to Nimue's gift? Um, and so in that process, I kind of honed in on some of the virtual instruments that I thought Nimue's gift had that, you know, are core to the Elevalon sound. This should transfer over. And then I expanded into a number of new VSTs that I think are core to that troll sound. And I tried to merge the two. Um, so, for example, with Nimue's gift... There are those three kind of interlude tracks. Um, for example, they all have really long, um, absurd, and kind of obnoxious <laughs> names. Yeah. Uh, but, like, wow. If I can't um, tell you these off the top of my head, that's not great. But <laughs> No, no. it's You're really on the spot. No, it's uh, like one of them would be Ere the Dawn's Rays, Chase Night's Mists Away, right? Where it, it comes out of Trial of the Golden Arrow. There's a little high sort of um, flute motif that plays at the end of Trial of the Golden Arrow. It's throughout the song, and then the rest of the song fades away, and that keeps going, and then it builds into the next song. The next song is built out of it. And I go from you know the, the Mellotron horns, the Mellotron flutes, a lot of the lute parts, um, and reedy stuff and big percussion. I strip all that away, and it goes down to like a... Um, it's a, a classic sort of uh, retro synthesizer, digital remake of an analog synthesizer. Um, and so those synth parts, I was like, well, I think those have a very like 80s fantasy movie nostalgia vibe. That's what I wanted it to be, almost like a, a reverie or a trance and you feel like you're sure. sucked back into the 80s and then it takes you to an, a new song. Um, and that to me seemed absolutely core to the type of heroic fantasy you would get out of those 80s movies, not core to the Troll album. And so I did away with those. I found um, a new synth that I kind of replaced that with in my suite and then introduced some new sort of, you know, more folky instruments that, like you mentioned, the didgeridoo, there's a bunch of war horns and... Uh, yeah, yeah reedy stuff going on so yeah i brought those things in new percussion um and yeah tried to only use those right so the core things to the elvalon sound the mellotron horns the mellotron flute um i got new lutes or i tried to use them less because again with the troll album i don't know if lutes are core to the sound as much as some of the other stuff sure so, yeah yeah that was kind of the process there if that makes sense Oh, that makes total sense. And that was a very long in depth answer. And I appreciate how you approach that. The, the idea of how the second album is much more uh, intentional. It's less experimental is something I can completely relate to. And I can also relate to how that's, it's sort of like a logical approach to selecting instruments. Like you, you kind of parse out what's me uh, what's the sound overall? What's the sound for this album? Uh, it makes total sense that you would have that way of handling it. And I think that some of those, like I wouldn't have noticed the like lighter, more heroic sense that you dropped out as being missing from the sound. Like it still feels like Elevalon on this album. It doesn't feel like Elevalon uh, minus the lighthearted sense. So, I, yeah, I think that that approach really works out there. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. I think, um, yeah, I, what ended up happening is I kind of did a one-to-one a -one swap for, instead of those maybe heroic, nostalgic synths, it, it became dark and sort of eerie synths. Um, and 
kind of chunkier synths. You know, I wanted a, a big sound that, uh, you know, sounds like strange, large humanoids yeah. tromping through the woods. So Yeah. Man, I, that brings up a ton of technical questions. But first, I kind of want to get into something that you mentioned uh, a little towards the beginning of that answer. So it, you seem to have a... a fairly personal relationship with a lot of this uh, trollish folklore, Scandinavian trollish folklore, as you put it. Uh, can you talk about how you've been exposed to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess it's going to be hard to do without diving into a pretty exhaustive um, Fela family history here, but oh, okay. you know, so be it. That's totally fine. <laughs> so be it, whatever you're um, comfortable with. Yeah, so my dad uh, immigrated to the U S when he was a kid. Um, and he was born in France, but, um, his dad was French, although not, he was actually born in Egypt, but he was a French guy. And, um, my grandmother was born in Finland. Uh, and so growing up, you know, I was always close with both of my grandparents. Um, and they definitely injected a lot of, um, just their kind of cultural background into, my life. I didn't even think too much of it, but I, I grew up with, you know, a lot of that and uh, really have grown to, to love it as I uh, got older. And many of my, like, many of the things I most love in life are, you know, kind of tied to that. Um, and so, for example, um, some listeners may be familiar with things like uh, the Asterix comics, um, which are like a Franco-Belgian, um, you know, comic series, comic that was okay. uh, published in Europe for a long time. Uh, and they have to do with like the, the ancient Gauls um, who are, you know, fighting against Romans. They're essentially um, like uh, early French uh, barbarians, you could say, or, uh, you know, pagan uh, cultures who fought against the Romans and were eventually conquered. But, you know, those comics kind of stylized those Gauls and um, romanticized them. And uh, they're, they're super fun and good. And, um, that comes up a lot actually in this writing, even though it's not necessarily tied to the trolls, but we can get to that later. Um, sure. On the other hand, my grandmother was always telling me all kinds of wacky stories. Uh, she's from Finland and um, one, one topic was always trolls. Um, I remember specifically as a kid, I was probably six, seven. We were going to visit Finland um, as a family and we were walking around in the, the Finnish countryside in these kind of, uh, really steep, craggy granite hills. There are all these huge pine and birch trees around us uh, that are towering into the air, and there's moss covering everything. And, you know, she was pointing out where, you know, there are these logs that are, they've been in the forest for quite a long time, and moss and lichens are kind of eating them away, so they're hollow inside, but they're totally covered in moss. And they're, you know, slowly being reabsorbed into the ground. And um, so she would point out and be like, ah, the trolls live there or the gnomes live there. Ah. That's a, that's a troll home. Don't come at night or you'll see, you know, they might get you. But if you look closely and you're careful, you can see like their eyes peeking out. Um, so, you know, those types of things are, you know, looking at these granite faces with uh, the moss on them, you know, it, it's a very yeah. striking thing as a kid. And I remember coming back maybe 10 years later in uh, high school and, you know, going on a similar walk and still having that kind of sense of awe, um, and, you know, between then and, you know, now, really, I mean, my whole life, I've been into fantasy video games as well. And just these stories of trolls as a kid, you know, whenever trolls come up, I'd always get excited. Um, <laughs> and so the name Elvalon comes from a game called Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, um, where it's the, the god of healing that you could worship and gain favor with um, or piety. And, um, you know, one of the things you can do is play as a troll, which was of course always my go-to and i've only beat the game once and it was as a troll oh um, so i don't know trolls have always kind of occupied a special place in my heart and uh you know it's it's sort of a goofy and highly uh, they have so much character to them in a lot of the drawings you know discovering uh, there are a few artists who draw a lot of trolls um and i fell in love with their works pretty young um there was the Spiderwick Chronicles series, which I probably read when sure. I was, you know, nine or ten. Yeah. The trolls depicted in that were incredible. 
Um, I, mean, so I scary. totally forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> that old book series. They like it would eat, you know, kids who went into the woods and yeah. it's crazy. You know, they're coming up from under the, the bridge and snatching people off, pulling them into the water. Uh, and the way they're depicted, you know, they're so covered in kelp and slime and, you know, slowly looming from under the the dark water beneath the bridge. <laughs> it's, it's I, I don't know, something about that has always really... Uh, got me excited i think it's super cool and so as a kid i loved those books and then i guess the one of the central themes about those books was that there was this guide to the magical world that you know the children's were uh the children who are the protagonists of the, the tale their grandfather i think wrote the guide and it's you know has a section on fairies and bogarts and all kinds of other folkloric magical creatures and one of them was trolls and i just I remember looking through there and loving the art. The art was incredible. And I think it was Tony Deiter Lisi who wrote that. Uh, and it said in that book that John Bauer was where you know, he got a lot of inspiration for how, for how he drew his trolls. And so later I made that connection and I looked into the art of John Bauer. And, you know, he was a late 1800 Swedish guy, I think. And, um, I mean, all of his troll drawings are absolutely incredible. So much character and, you know, vibrant life. Um, and this just incredible depiction of the deep woods that the trolls live in and they're slinking around in the dark and, you know, having these strange rituals and things. And yet they're also not necessarily hostile. You know, sometimes in those they're friendly. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Yeah. Um, something really cool and romantic about that. And I think Theodore Kittelson is a is a popular one, too. I think he was Norwegian. Um, yeah. And then there's um, the guy who ended up making the album cover for Drums in the Deep Wood, who is... Um, David Thierry, I think. I probably butchered that, but um, <laughs> yeah, and he kind of draws in a way that's inspired by, you know, some of those folks, and he's been um, drawing trolls for a long time, I guess, and, you know, I happened upon his artwork a couple of years ago, maybe, um, and reached out to him, so I don't know. That was really long-winded, but... That was great! That's Everyone loves the long-winded sections. <laughs> it's so... It's so neat to hear that you had a like a very deep rooted childhood connection. I, I guess I kind of figured when you mention troll folklore, that being a, maybe like a hobby thing that you get into looking into as an adult, and to hear that you have this childish uh, childhood connection, uh, that really enhances like the connection that I imagine you have as you're writing this. Yeah, and to absolutely. be able to cite so many sources of trolls. <laughs> is is very impressive for sure you know i guess i didn't realize until right now that i could cite so many sources of trolls but here we are someone of an um, expert i i guess i might be <laughs> who knows I, I did write an album about him i guess um, it's really interesting what you point out that uh there's somewhat of a comic relief element that's consistent because I, i've never thought about it but that's pretty true even in more serious uh works usually like scenes or sections with the trolls they're a bit of comedic relief or at least they're a bit inherently goofy and uh absolutely uh, it's interesting to capture that uh musically i don't know if it was intentional but uh, some of the instrument choices uh i'm thinking uh maybe it's just stones beneath the bridge uh you start out with some sort of twangy sound that feels so trollish to me it uh it really fits in there Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, I don't. I guess I don't know if I interpret or I, I uh, put any comic relief into the album per se, but um, you're totally right about trolls being kind of comic relief. I mean, just thinking of like Tolkien, they're often yeah. the butt of jokes. Or if you've played right, uh, right. The Witcher Three, uh, the trolls in that are side-splittingly funny, at least to me. My brother and I are <laughs> always talking about the troll jokes they make in that game and kind of cackling about it they're so funny um yeah a lot of character there so yeah i guess it's interesting to see uh subject for an album where the they're so you know dark often and uh you know they're they're usually some sort of antagonist role although you mentioned that's not always the case and uh I don't know. It's it's more than just a typical bad guy, like an, an evil knight or something. There's so much. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's so much character behind trolls that I hadn't really thought uh, directly about. 
Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And for me going into this, I think, um, you know, a lot of times people want to do what you could call like uh, the root canals on something where you're you're going in and you're finding everything in there and you're pulling it up and I guess you're you're really displaying a holistic view of what that thing is. Um, and for me, I, I didn't want to do that. I, you know, I don't even know how you could do that musically. Uh, but more, yeah, I just wanted it to be kind of a, a celebration of the, the idea of trolls and what they mean to me, I guess. And, um, you know, I, I thought a lot about going into it, like what are similar to the previous part where it's like, what's core to Elevalon? Like what is core to trolls, right? Where there are probably a certain just number of like classic troll stories, right? There's like, yeah. you're hanging out with like, you're captured by a troll and you're, you're having riddles, right? And if you win, you can go, but if you lose, you get eaten or, um, you know, you're going across a bridge and a troll comes up and snatches you or the trolls yeah. are, they're really hungry, right? Trolls are always super hungry. So they're sneaking into say the farmer's, um, fields and carrying off their sheep, right? Um, that, or, you know, they're mysterious, strange, sort of humanoid pagan folk who live out in the, the hinterlands and the, the deep woods. Um, or when they see sunlight, they're turned to stone, right? So, or when sunlight sees them, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of tried to come up with just some of these ideas and put them into a, you know, that each song, I guess, represents an idea like that for me. And I tried to sonically represent what that idea might sound like and so yeah i don't know like some would say oh yeah a troll is a a big oaf or maybe trolls are are made of stone and sunlight just turns them more to stone i i don't know they are whatever the story needs them to be and they're kind of strange and maybe ill understood creatures of our fo folkloric past right so in my mind when I'm writing this, I'm imagining trolls as huge and lumbering going through the forest. I'm also imagining them as small and wearing leather shoes and funny hats and <laughs> running around in the forest and you know, maybe abducting people and taking them to meet their troll chieftain or whatever it is, you know, there are lots of ways these creatures are kind of depicted and I wanted to just take a bunch of vignettes and musically represent those and what you know try to make it as as authentic feeling as possible yeah well capturing uh kind of the broad range of what they can offer is uh it's done really well here i uh is yeah you mention when you mention that and then i read through the track names that stands out so much uh the way that you've kind of got all of the ideas that can be associated with them in the mix here and there's not one one image that you're trying to depict maybe Right. Yeah, I was when I was writing it, I sort of so there's like poetry or I guess prose um that I wrote that you know there's for the album intro as a whole and then a uh, one sort of set for each track. And they all sort of represent um you know how I feel about that track and what that might, you know, they might hint at what I'm kind of getting at, what sort of vignette of trolldom, I guess you could say, uh that I I'm kind of representing and in doing so there you could tie a common narrative thread between them all right you could look at these and say ah right that makes sense um, based on this one and this one there's a clear sort of plot here that could tie through it but you could also read it and not get that thread um, I kind of set it up intentionally to be sort of multi interpretive I love when people listen to my music and say wow, I had this amazing mental imagery of this thing that I totally had never thought of ever in my entire life and never would have thought of. I'm like, wow, that's just amazing. I love that you said that because it shows how maybe multifaceted music can be and maybe implies that my music is somewhat multifaceted as well. I love to hear it. So. Oh, yeah. And kind of along those lines, thinking back to your first album and uh, to our conversation on this show about that, I know that you had a lot of emphasis on a somewhat personal quest of going out and, and seizing adventure and opportunity. And I see here uh, 
you know, the questing soul is something that returns in some of the prose that you wrote. Uh, is is that something that you consider a core value of Elevalon? And, and if so, how does reaching out for new inspiring things uh, kind of interact with the ideas that are exclusive to this album? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, actually. And yeah, I very intentionally made sure to keep some of the you know, the prose that was present in the first album, in the second one, and um, that idea of the questing soul and being on the questing path um, is something that is just very central to my outlook on life and um, my own personal philosophies and what I stand for and how I strive to live my own life, um, treating life as if it's a quest and I'm the protagonist and um, trying to inspire the people around me to do the same thing. Um, and so that will probably, I mean, that's absolutely core to Elevalon as I see it. And that will probably be integrated into every Elevalon album I can think of. I see. Um, everything that is ideated at this point, um, that's already kind of tied into the concept. So with this one, yeah, I was kind of taking it in a different way where, um, you know, being in the deep woods and being surrounded by the alien, the eerie, the potentially hostile and dangerous um, is truly a place where you would need to have a questing soul, or so I would think. I um, see, yeah. And so that's kind of the take I took there, integrating that. And, you know, on that journey of the questing soul that takes you into the the brambles and the briars of the deep wood, you know, you you'll certainly have many quests and some of them might be adversarial and in some you might learn more about yourself by embracing maybe some of the mysteries that you encounter there. Um, it's hard to say. I guess part of the, what inspired that, interestingly enough, which is very much adjacent to the idea of trolls, I'd say it's not necessarily linked, although it's sort of linked, um, would be a Stephen King book, actually. Uh, which comes out of the the Dark Tower series. It's Dark Tower, I feel like, 4.5, um, A Wind Through the Keyhole. Oh. Where, essentially, there's a, there's a part where a, a young child is um, essentially forced to flee into what's known as Faganard Swamp, and uh, strange humanoid creatures and dragons are known to lurk there, and it's, um, you know, this swamp is at the heart of a, a huge and an extremely dense uh, forest of what are called ironwoods. And, you know, this book kind of, it's a story within a story, but it's a great story um, <laughs> where, you know, this child is essentially fleeing into this forest at night and having this great adventure. And uh, I don't know if I was actively thinking about that while I was tying these concepts together in my head, but later on, you know, between when I finished the album and the prose and now, you know, I, I definitely put it together that there was a strong resemblance there. Um, just an example of, you know, someone sojourning on the path of the questing soul uh, into the deep woods, right? And, yeah. Um, yeah, and that type of inspiration is so exciting to realize the more subconscious one where you, you don't know you're being inspired by it until you've kind of finished the work or gotten well into it. So it's, uh, it's always nice to see that. Something somewhat along those lines, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, characters or maybe locations that are in the the titles here. I see that Gahanka is directly uh, attributed to something from a Terry Pratchett novel. Uh, what's going on with some of the other kind of proper nouns within the album? Are those things like Pycon, Luola, uh, is that something that you've come up with or is that directly related to something that PyCon specifically stands out uh, with uh, the lyrics being, uh, I'm not sure what language that is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Is, is there, are all of the elements uh, like the deep wood, for example, uh, is that kind of just an idea that you've come up with in your head or are they generally tied back to some uh, like fully created work? Yeah, great question. I was really hoping you would ask about uh, Pecan, <laughs> oh, great. Uh, Pecan Loola specifically. 
Um, that is my grandmother's contribution to the album. Um, I visit her a lot, and uh, yeah, I'll come over. And when I was working on this album, I, I would come over and get really excited to tell her about you know the troll music I've been working <laughs> on, and I would show it, and she would get this kind of gleam in her eye, and I'd ask her, you know, what do you think? And uh, she would tell me, you know, hmm, well, this song I think you should call Fake on Luola, which in Finnish translates to like Troll's Grotto. Um, Ooh. And so I was like, absolutely, yes. I can't wait to make that the title. Um, and so, yeah, it's sort of a really nice way to tie in, um, you know, someone who's had such a profound impact on my life in so many different ways, not just this one. Um, not just trolls. Not just trolls. She's got a ton of character and is an amazing woman. Um, and, yeah, it has influenced my life in so many ways. Wow. So, um, yeah, that, that's where that came from. And then the, the language there is all Finnish. Um, I was talking to, uh, everyone's favorite rune song or Tony, yeah, Tony, Tony of rune song fame about the album. And, um, he corrected my grammar a little bit on how I had <laughs> spelled Pake on Lola. And, uh, I asked him if he could, you know, write the lyrics for that, um, for that track. And so he wrote me a it's actually, a, I believe it's a Kalevala meter poem in Finnish, which, you know, I, I voice recorded uh, a little recording of myself uh, and sent it to him to see what he thought. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just super fun. How was the pronunciation? He yeah. said my pronunciation was quite good. And oh, there we go. What, yeah, that's what my grandmother says as well. I attribute it to the fact that I've been listening to Finnish heavy metal probably since I was 11 or 12. Um, okay. And, you know, over time, you kind of start, even if I have no idea what they're saying, you start to pick up some of the, I guess, the lingual modes of pronunciation or whatever. So Wow, that's a, a better answer than I could have ever expected. That was so sincere and interesting to hear. Absolutely. And I didn't even get to all of it, I think. Um, oh, please keep going. Because I, I talk about the deep wood and the deep places and Yeah, you yeah, like the that. other spots. And, and really, to me that it's a very Orangian concept, right? Where right. this is the, in in my head, this is the archetypal deepest of deep woods where the most fearsome of fearsome and most mysterious of mysteries, you know, that all the, where the terrors of the night dwell. And, you know, it's so dense and deep that you can't go more than a few miles in before you have to turn back. And there are huge raging rivers and swamps uh, and you know all kinds of just crazy stuff it's the the archetypal black forest of yeah um, my imagination and where all these creatures surely reside oh that's lovely that's so neat yeah thank you i'm i'm pretty excited about it and so like <laughs> yeah the first track a great stirring i guess what what's happening in my mind there is like you know there's this great forest and maybe you're on the the outskirts of it but you're near this great forest and you see it you know stretching further and further out maybe blotting out the entire landscape in that direction and you know you're it's peaceful and it's nice but you know it's unconquered territory it's unknown territory and uh you know you start hearing the pounding of these drums very faint at first far off misty and uh slowly they build and war horns start calling out until you know, this, these huge blasts of trumpets and drums erupt and the birds are scared off and surely something great and terrible is stirring in the deep wood once again, calling us to new adventures and uh, opening up a new path for the questing soul to sojourn down, I guess. Oh, man. Yeah, unfathomable trumpets. I, I really like that description there. Uh, really captures all of that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm proud of that one. That was a, uh, another callback from uh, album one, Pro. Oh, Pride. really? Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I wrote about unfathomable trumpets uh, wreathed in the deepest of fog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah, it's yeah. just something core to the aesthetic, I think. So. Yeah, you really capture that uh, exciting, fantastical element in your writing as well. Thank you. Just like with the prose, you mean? Yeah, yeah, with the prose. It's, you know, like uh, 
the word choice really, really helps paint the picture. I think there's, you know, we have so many connotations with things that maybe technically have uh, similar definitions. And I feel like your, uh, your use of language and your vocabulary, uh, it just rings true. It just works out so well here. Yeah. Thank you. I, you know, it's probably just the result of having been so steeped in fantasy books and games and comics you know for basically my entire life and just loving the sort of medieval side of it i feel like it comes pretty naturally and i have almost as fun as much fun writing that stuff as i do the the music itself i, I love <laughs> reading poetry and you know writing the poetry and the prose it's it's a total blast so glad you're appreciating it nice so, so to pivot a bit we've talked a ton about the kind of non-musical media or, or just ideas that have influenced the album uh, what have you been listening to? Uh, what's been some of the musical inspiration, either like direct stuff that you're analyzing or more subconscious? I remember for your first album, you were doing a lot of uh, direct research on medieval music. Yeah. Could you just talk about the, the musical side of things here? Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I did a lot of research, but I did some <laughs> uh, on the first album. A lot of it is just also drawn by my my intuition and you know where i think the okay. melody should go and that sort of thing it's it's probably pseudo medieval but nothing wrong with that <laughs> um but yeah there so i actually was prepared for this question and i wrote down Ooh. um actually during the recording of the album so i saw something orang had done um or wrong i guess i don't know um oh yeah i have no idea <laughs> but he had sort of a like a what do you call it? Like a scrap board, almost like a Pinterest board of uh, okay. like album influences that he posted somewhere at some point in time. For one I of think I remember releases. seeing that. Yeah. And I saw that and I was like early in the stages of writing um, the troll album drums in the deep wood. And um, so I was like, yeah, I can do that. And I kind of came up, I realized I had about three specific sort of, categories that the inspirations fell into um and so i can start with dungeon synth um specifically uh the the biggest influences on this album from the dungeon synth sphere or, or the dungeon synth sphere uh were halberdier with um i think it's to return home victorious um muka probelli uh with the uh, bogs and frogs and nightly fog of classic um which those two albums are so underrated and anytime sure. anyone ever asks me what you know dungeon synth they should listen to that's always my answer and i don't care because it's so good um <laughs> and then uh lofi is another one who's a yeah uh i hear Finnish that artist. for sure yeah huge fan of all of his stuff specifically um girmu karmu i think is how you would say it um is what inspired a lot of this album you know he has a a lot of great uh, you know, really authentic sounding folky runs. And I wasn't necessarily um, preoccupied with sounding so authentic per se, but um, definitely liked the vibe he had achieved and he had done it very well. Um, in addition to that, there are two more. Um, there's Erong's We Are the Past. Um, that was definitely an influence there. Um, pretty cool album. And that has a lot of sort of the pagan neo folk sort of vibe to it i guess okay um and then lunar wombs the sleeping green which is actually um there's a finnish folk metal band called fin troll um <laughs> and their keyboardist i think his name is it's henry something um but he wrote this album like back in the day and i guess lost it and then discovered it again oh. at random and re-released it and it's like a semi-modern classic um, so those are kind of the, the DS influences. I wanted to have a more um, like overtly DS sound worked into the core of the album itself because what I was realizing in the early writing process was I was very inspired by that sort of pagan, I don't know, Nordic neo-folk sort of genre that's popped up in, I don't know, however many years. Yeah. Has or been more popularized, um, but has certainly been around for a very long time. 
um, where artists like um, Vardruna or like Ivar Bjornsson, Einar Selvik, um, Heilung, uh, who else? Hedningarna or Nest. Uh, those are, I guess, some of the ones that specifically influenced me that I really like, um, where they play this sort of like very authentic feeling, you know, with lots of folk instruments like a, a Nordic or maybe like Iron Age barbarian, pagan, European form of um, music. It's very traditional and often, you know, analog recorded, um, you know, them playing these folk instruments. And it just has a very primal and pulsing and pounding feeling. And that's what I wanted to use the cap to capture the, the feeling of these trolls. Um, and so I found a, you know, a VST library that I, I purchased and was using. It has a lot of these types of instruments and really felt I was capturing the vibe of it. But then I realized I'm basically just making a, you know, one of these dark folk albums or whatever you <laughs> want to classify it as. I'm making one of these albums, but with VSTs, not with analog instruments. And that is like significantly less cool. And I'm a dungeon synth artist, so let's make sure to really get the synth feeling there too. Because we yeah. want it to feel spooky and eerie and have these kind of go almost borderline goofy synths going to remind you that it's a dungeon synth and so that's kind of where the the halberdier um muka probelli and uh like lunar womb and even a wrong um influences came in so there's that class there's the you know the the folk or the i guess the nordic folk class like with the high Lung and uh heading arna and all those um and then there's the the folk metal list of inspirations fin troll is one of them they're a hilarious band um where they mix, you know, Nordic folk music with metal, and um, it's heavy and it grooves, and you know, it has that sort of Nordic charm to it. And so I wanted to capture that. Um, I wanted the heaviness in this album, and I think, I mean, you, you may or may not agree, but you know, I really tried to get at least a few tracks where it just there were parts that definitely felt like they had almost the level of hit that a metal album would. Um, and so, like Fin Troll, uh, Thy Catafalque. Uh, who else? Uh, Vanaheim is another one. Um, these sort of uh, folk metal or uh, type bands. That Catafalque is interesting because that's a Hungarian um, metal band that mixes in a lot of really like funky synths and Hungarian folk music. And it oh, sounds almost yeah. like... It's, it's yeah, it sounds form. It's pretty sweet, but it it's, almost sounds like step music. Like it's very galloping and driving and yeah there's a lot of black metal in there but i don't know it's crazy incredible artist if you haven't listened to them i would i couldn't recommend thy catafalque more it's also like a guy and his wife i think do everything and incredibly talented people oh that's a super um, cool setup yeah yeah so there's that and then there's another group that i wrote down here um called neptunian maximalism which is like a belgian avant-garde doom jazz group i guess <laughs> okay. they're absolutely nuts um if you haven't listened to them and you like my new album i would i could not recommend you listen to their album aeons or eons um more it's essentially it, it really perfects the sort of sound of like a borderline hellish like crazed fantastical ritual um they have all these like jazz instruments and percussion elements i think it was all done live and it's just a real tour de force um of like what someone can do when an album is intelligently written i mean it's like clearly jazz but it's like no other jazz you've ever heard so there's that and then there were some just traditional music uh, influences as well um there's an there's a channel on YouTube that's called like the Traditional Music Channel. They have a video <laughs> called Tatar Folk Music, and it is so good. Uh, I listen to that all the time. They have all kinds of cool like uh, I think they're called Tal Harpa, which is like a a bowed lyre. Um, so it's like a, a lyre type instrument, but you play it with a bow, and it's kind of deeper. They have a lot of that. There's a lot of the cool throat singing going on, um, and just really nice folk melodies. Um, so yeah, other than that, I don't know, maybe the Witcher 3 OSD a little bit, because <laughs> that's kind of got that sort of a similar vibe to the Tatar folk, 
honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah, those well, yeah. Are, those are the main influences. That's what I'm citing. So. Yeah, that's a a very diverse lineup there with the kind of the three core uh, I don't know classes or families of music that you're pulling from and. As you lay them out, I can certainly see the influences of all three of them in the music. And when you say uh, things like primal and high energy, as well as uh, big hits like in uh, in metal, big moments like that, I can absolutely see it here. I think uh, I think that the drums are something that somewhat ties all of those together and really stands out uh, on this album. Uh, and that's something that I'd kind of like to dive more into. Uh, so I think in general, you you embrace like rhythm and syncopation far more than many Dungeon Synth projects that I find. Uh, you can get a real Dungeon Synth groove, and, and I can see how maybe that comes into play from listening to those uh, categories of music so much and kind of letting them bleed into your sound here. Uh, I don't know how intentional that is when you're actually writing it or if it's just something that comes out, but can you talk about writing percussion parts uh, in general about your approach to it? Absolutely. Um, interestingly enough, I was writing music for a different level on release, which is yet to come out um, before I was working on this one. And so I was doing a cover of an Irish folk band doing a Christmas song. And I was like, cool, uh, let me just bring up the drums. And, you know, I started getting my percussion together and writing it. And I was like, holy cow, this sounds like High Loom, which is like this really heavy but very authentic sounding sort of folk project. Um, from Germany, I think. Maybe they're Dutch. Anyways. <laughs> um, and it was going to be, you know, like one of those, and I was just listening to it. And I was like, all right, this isn't a cover anymore. I'm looping these drums, and I'm pulling up my reedy <laughs> instrument, and I'm just going to freestyle. And I got probably 10 looped takes of what was, you know, probably like a 45 second section um, where I'm just riffing. And that ended up being the first song on the album that I wrote, which was Take On Luola. Oh, no way. Yeah, and so, you know, it was heavily adapted and whatnot. Um, but yeah. the that reedy synth part, the sort of bagpipey sounding guy, um, that really became the core of that song. And uh, so I ended up doing that a lot throughout the album where you know i would listen to a bunch of folk type music whether it be irish or um nordic or even slavic and uh or step and um from there you know i would listen to it a bunch and then you know go about my day and then i would pull up reaper later and be like all right let's come up with a a rhythm and not really try to take it from anywhere but just kind of synthesize all the ideas i had heard earlier in the day until i came up with a groove which was sufficiently um nasty i guess um, <laughs> you know i really wanted to give you that sort of uh, like muka probelli type vibe where you're like yeah the groove is hitting yeah because uh, it's not common in dungeon synth and once i had that then i would just start to um, improvise on top of that and that's where a lot of the writing came from so really i mean core to a lot of this was um getting that sort of you know, building everything up on top of those drums, because the drums are so core, at least in my head, to, you know, what these trolls are up to. Um, and I guess <laughs> they're up kinda, to, yeah. yeah, I don't know. They're out in the totally. woods playing drums. That's what I think. That's that's what I think trolls are yeah, up to. Even on your cover, I think one's got a one's got a drum. Yeah, I made sure of that. There was no <laughs> way. I think they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that big, and that's like a cool, um, I think it's a, like a Sami, uh, like traditional shamanic drum if i Ooh. understand correctly like the north of finland um there's an ethnic group up there that i think plays drums like that which i think is super cool um that you know david knew about that and was like yeah i'm gonna throw that in on the album which i think is just oh, awesome yeah um 
Yeah. Oh, and so, I don't know, like, maybe to some people trolls don't play drums, but for me it was important. And this is actually where I got the name of the album. Um, it's funny because it happened, like, five years maybe before I even had any idea that this album was going to be a thing and didn't even know what Dungeon Synth was, but I was a... Um, I was in college and I was reading The Lord of the Rings for the second time. And there's the part where they're in Moria and uh, I think it's Pippin. Yeah, Peregrine Took. Fool of a Took. He uh, he <laughs> knocks the, the skeleton into the well and it's uh, right. you know, super loud and then silent. And then the drums in the deep start pounding. And uh, oh, captured yeah. super well in the movies. It's just brilliant how they did it. Um and that always had a big impact on me. And I was like, I remember being in college and I was like writing metal stuff. And I was like, yeah, I want a song called Drums in the Deep. And I just couldn't make the drums sound cool. And then, I don't know, it kind of came <laughs> to me. It's like Drums in the Deep Wood. It's like a, a fun kind of riff on that. And then, you know, translating from goblins and orcs of, in the mountains to trolls. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how similar they are. Who, who even knows what either of those things are? <laughs> so, I don't know. It's just where it kind of came from those are the connections in my head so nice so yeah that's pretty interesting i i feel like uh a lot of people i guess if you don't write something you might not realize how broad the inspiration can be and you pulling from folk songs and things like that uh it's it's just neat what happens when you take you know one or two elements from something and then apply it to something pretty different uh it can uh, really stand out as something like totally, totally different than the source material. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. And I think it's something we've sort of touched on in the past where like, yeah, you know, if you're writing a concept album, like even if it's say based on a book, you know, if I were writing that concept album, my advice would be like, Hey, uh, I know it's based on that book, but Hey, there are probably a, a number of other adjacent books and movies maybe, and even video games or, poets or you know uh, paintings <laughs> or something that could all have a little nugget of something that would just be perfect if you you know you thought about it um so i i really just try not to i guess shoe uh, pigeonhole pigeonhole myself into the yeah you know like i only take from this and this is about that it's like no nah, you know these <laughs> the world is a broad and strange place and uh, anything is possible i think and i don't know i like to kind of synthesize the the 3d maybe metaphysical space you know carve it out of all of the various um inspiration from all of the different sources that have touched on it in one way or another where um i guess it's like that story of the what the people who fall in the pit and there's an elephant and they're all blind i don't think i know that story oh uh, it's like an old parable i have no idea if i'm getting this right but <laughs> the idea is like three blind guys like fall into a, a pit and there's an elephant in there and uh they can't see so they're like what the heck is in this pit and one guy like touches the side of it and it's like you know it's all leathery so they're like oh it's like uh oh well, i don't know what would be big and leather it's a boulder <laughs> right it's all like craggy kind of it's like oh okay, it's a big old yeah. it's a big old boulder and then someone else like you know there's like a trunk and they touch the trunk and it's like oh uh, it's clearly a snake or, you know, someone touches the, the tusk and is, you know, it's like a big pile of bones. And then someone else like looks in and is like, no, it's an elephant. Right. So you have like, uh -huh. I guess like cultural things like this folkloric things. It's like many people have many little stories about them that offer one little insight, one little vignette into what they represent and what they are. And so if I really want to have an authentic look at them, you know, I want to synthesize, I want to be the person looking into the pit and be like, ah, well, maybe it's this and try to kind of combine and concoct all those ideas into something that's more than the sum of its parts. Yeah, that's excellent advice to, to try to avoid that tunnel vision that can be so easy to get and, and cast a little bit of a wider net there. So one thing, uh, sort of pivoting off of that, uh, I really appreciate that you're able to write uh, very long songs. And I say this in a good way, like six, seven minute songs that are, uh, I don't know, they're fresh the whole time and they keep your interest. You don't realize that all that, you know, you don't feel like you're doing a task for six or seven minutes. It flies by. Uh, could you, I don't, I don't, I'm sure that you don't have a, like a rule book that you stick to, but 
that's pretty consistent with your work. What are some ways that you keep a track fresh as as you're writing it, as you're maybe repeating uh, sections, uh, you know, throughout the piece? Uh, yeah, what do you do to make it stay exciting and, and not get boring there? For sure. Um, I guess one thing that was kind of instrumental in, I think, that process and just keeping the, the album sounding maybe, you know, not repetitive from track to track. Because sometimes you hear an album and it's like, okay, this sounds really good, but then the next song is like, yeah, but sure, it's the same yeah. thing. It's just been like changed a little bit. Um, I really like to write, like I only want to write a song if I have a reason to write that song, right? Um, for example, Moss Laden and Shambling is like, I don't know, I just had this really fun mental image um I think based on a Theodore Kittleson painting, maybe. Um, it could be someone else. I don't remember. Um, but of like, you know, walking through these deep woods and there's a, some shambling figure off in the, you know, yeah. in the, the twilight woods and they're just totally encrusted in all forms of lichens and moss and maybe kelp and, you know, all kinds of vegetation. And they're just huge and trembling along. And maybe all you can see are their glowing eyes from under the, the thick and matted plant matter and um you know in that case it's like oh yeah i want this huge sounding primeval and lumbering song and i want it to boom boom you know maybe big timpanies and really th a thick um sort of wall of sound right and so i have big heavy synths that kind of feel like footfalls and it's kind of ponderous right so you're you know you've got a big hit and then it's slows down until there's another big hit you know it feels like there are big transients where you've got a spike and then it's slowing down right yeah and so i don't know i guess all of that i'm just sharing because in a way it's like i wrote that song because i had an idea in my head and i didn't just sit down at the keyboard and say oh well today i'm gonna write a song um and really sticking to that idea um is I think what allows me to keep these things fresh where this, that was definitely something I did less of in the first Elevalon album. And I found myself running into more of an issue where I was like, Oh, you know, I feel like my song structures are getting a little repetitive here where I have like ambient intro. I build up the instruments one at a time. There's a small like crescendo and then we strip things away and we bring in a counter melody and then that builds up and you have both the first and the second melody and a big crescendo at the end and it ends, right? I see, um, yeah. I did that a lot. Um, and in this one, I was very, very much going for, you know, there were definitely some tracks in the first album that were like, hey, here's an idea, like, uh, say, Quarry of the Men Here Carver. That's a big nod to Asterix and Obelix comics. Um, or like the second track, Secrets Under a Dolmen. Very similar thing. Uh, Asterix and Obelix comic reference with, uh, you know, so those two songs specifically have a sort of different structure from the rest because I'm pulling from that um, imagery that was in my head beforehand. And so I find when I'm, you know, writing from a vignette or an image in my head, I think, okay, how can I sonically represent this? And then you get a sound going, you get a groove going and it's so, okay, well, how is this going to modulate? And, you know, I'm going to go into the next section, but it's going to similar to that elephant metaphor you know, you're taking a, a, a different look at the same thing. So how, how can I differently sonically represent a different aspect of this idea? And so from there, you know, you end up at a different section and it sounds different, but it's still clearly the same song. And I feel like that kind of drives you through uh, the writing process differently. And then, you know, you end up with different song sections and I still might say, okay, I want a big crescendo here and I really want it to hit. And that's just, you know, because it's something I like, or I really want it to groove out here because that's something I like, but it's more intentional and I'm not just writing a song, say, to write a song. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems like much more of a, a foundational approach is, is how you tackle this. You want to have a tight, clean concept as you're starting the song, and then that, that allows you to keep things interesting and, and keep things tied together uh, as you add multiple sections because there's kind of a, a conceptual core uh, keeping everything in the same mindset. So uh, another angle that I was kind of looking at things, uh, 
a lot of people aren't really familiar with how much goes into the album after it's written. So if you could talk a bit about that process, I know that you've been saying uh, the album's been written for quite a while and there's, there's the mixing and the mastering and all the little logistics. Um, you know, any you don't want to get rid of the secret sauce if there's any specific steps you want to withhold. But yeah, what what goes into the album after you're you know done writing it? Yeah, so I've talked a lot about I guess the 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 imagery. So I'll start with that. Um, I had clear guides and rough song titles um, going into writing the album and during the writing process. And you know, it probably took me four or five months of I don't know, 15 hours a week, maybe, uh, well, probably more than that. Um, but you know, a lot of diligent work on writing these and then you kind of finish up all the compositions and you're just tweaking things. And, you know, I think the second track was called troll chase for the longest time. Cause I knew I wanted it to be exciting and really get you going on the troll the, chase. Yeah. I was like, yeah, maybe you're getting chased by trolls and that's what that <laughs> sound like. And, um, but, you know, there's always these ideas in my head of maybe, you you know, maybe the protagonist is chasing the troll and the troll has your, you know, a sheep in the crook of each of its arms or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, I had these loose ideas and these rough song titles and some of the to- song titles started off and they were like, I know that's that this song is that like just stones under the bridge. Um, that one was it was set, it from the right? start. Like I, I was like, yes, this is a ven- vignette of trolldom that needs to be represented in, th- in this album or Moss Laden and Shambling. I think that's when I realized I could write a troll album. And I, you know, I was on that hike up in the, the woods and was like, yes, this, like, that's going to be a song on the album for sure. Um, so once everything was composed and, you know, kind of, more or less finished sonically, uh, that's when I started to really dial in the uh, the song titles, and then from there start writing the prose. The prose took me a couple weeks. Um, oh yeah. And I, you know, was still tweaking it basically until a few days ago. Um, wow. Until I, <laughs> until I had to have the cassette design done for Dungeons Deep. That was a big part of it too, finalizing the art. I love the art that David made for me. It's incredible. Um, but we were having a lot of trouble because it's so detailed and nuanced, um, getting the sort of Mm. the design element, the graphic design element to work, um, where, you know, it essentially there's this, uh, this border that's been presented in the art, um, that's right in the center, kind of at the bottom. And we were having trouble figuring out, you know, what color to do, what kind of text. And we were thinking like going into it, I was like, yeah, we're going to make a fancy new Elevalon logo and. You know, we worked on it a bunch, and they looked great, in my opinion, but nothing really fit, so we just kept it simple. Um, but yeah, tweaking that art and then getting the cassette layout done, um, that was a that was definitely a big portion of uh, the kind of post-writing phase uh, into, you know, before release. Um, other than that, I mean, um, I knew I wanted to... So, originally... The track, um, A Hunger to Carry Off Flocks, was meant to be the intro for most of the time. But I was thinking, you know, I really think it would be fun to make a trailer for this album. Kind of like I did for the first album. Yeah. Not not that anyone really saw it. But, um, (laughs) you know, just something where there's a huge kind of punch and it's like, you know, really light and then really heavy. And it kind of, for lack of a better way of saying it, knocks you on your ass. Um where you're yeah. just kind of left dumbfounded. I, I really wanted people to sit through that first intro track and think, oh, uh, I was not prepared for what this is going to be. Um, and so I wrote that after with the intention of like, yeah, this will be a sweet, like this would be great for like a, a movie trailer type thing. And I, I did end up releasing that a couple days ago. Um, so yeah, I made that that little video with uh, some of the nature ambiance and the poetry in there. And then it kind of hits you with the album cover and some, big drums and trumpets and reeds and stuff. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, other than that, it's the mix and the master, right? So, right. Yeah. Um, I, I work in Reaper, like I probably mentioned a few times on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, and I make each track its own project file. Um, and I have a template that I kind of work in, but, uh, you know, 
as I'm making the album, I'm finding new VSTs and taking out old ones and yeah. tweaking things. And by the end of the album, I've got nine project files that not, not one is, you know, has the same tracks and pan and um, sure, effects yeah. on it as any of the others. So a lot of that work is just combining them into one master project file. Um, just because I like to get my stuff professionally mixed. I'm totally blessed to be good friends with a uh, guy who owns a recording studio. Probably sound like a broken record, but you know, <laughs> I talk about it all the time because uh, you know, I'm excited about it. Um, but he's an incredible, um, I guess, mix audio engineer. And so yeah. I, I have him do everything. Um, so I, well, I get everything into a, uh, you know, a one complete project file and make sure they're all on the same tracks and everything is kind of buttoned up and nice and neat and i send that over to him and they're invariably like 10 15 problems and so i go in and <laughs> you know we try and fix those and then once it's fixed you know then we kind of get to the creative part where we're saying okay like you did this what if we to you know maybe represent that uh idea you had threw in like a slapback delay or you know just a tape cool. delay, whatever yeah. it is, you know, kind of creatively trying to um, accentuate the strengths of the record and really, you know, bring them in. Um, and then, you know, after that, we uh, there are a bunch of revisions where I'll send, you know, he'll send me uh, renders of each of the tracks. I'll listen and think, no, nah, this is absolutely garbage. Am I wasting my money? <laughs> this is terrible. But then you just like tweak one thing slightly and I'm like, wow, this is incredible. I never could have done this on my own. This is so much better than the demos. Uh, it's it's funny, but we we'll usually go through like five revisions or so, six. And okay. Then, you know, we've got a final pre-mastered mix and then we hang out in the studio and put it through all the mastering gear and I'll listen and, you know, we'll adjust things and eventually we come out of it with a full mix and it's ready to go. So I think with this one, we finished the, the mix and the master and... I was still waiting on the art and the poetry for quite a while. And so, and of course I wanted to release a single cause I wanted to um, submit it to see if I get on some of those Spotify playlists. Right. Um, which fingers crossed still fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah. We'll see if it happens. Um, so yeah, I released a single came up with art, you know, custom art for that, that again, it's not necessarily trollish. I don't know. It was just kind of adjacent. I wanted to explore, you know, sort of multivariate um set of ideas here yeah it's um, a good point it still captures everything that you would want to capture with the single and the context in the album right and like there are strange and ill-defined shapes kind of hiding under the um whatever those are and the gaps under the stone yeah yeah um, and you know some of them look like owls and some of them are just eyes shining in the darkness hard to tell what exactly they are <laughs> maybe they're trolls maybe they're not but that's kind of what i like is you know i think stephen king said like whatever is making the noise behind the closed door is way scarier than when you open it and see what it is i like that you know these folklore good creatures. philosophy yeah i like i like it being a big question mark as to what that yeah. can be the unknown is such a fun and eerie and strange thing and i love the just the sense of wonder you can a achieve by you know really truly in your heart believing that in whatever situation it is that you know it could be anything that's say for example behind that door There's something really romantic about that idea um and yeah something i wanted to, to capture so and that's kind of why i didn't put a troll on the uh on the the single cover yeah, a bit more subtlety there. Right. If uh, if it's not too soulless to get into, uh, can we talk a bit about, like, I guess, Dungeon Synth marketing? Sure. If, if if that's not a wild idea. Uh, like, I know that you make a lot of strategic choices with things. Like, you mentioned timing the, the single and everything to apply to these playlists. Uh you, like I see you, uh, you did the YouTube release two days before the official like streaming platform release. I feel like overall, uh, you've got a, a good head for getting your stuff out there without uh, missing opportunities, but without just throwing it in people's face. Do do you feel like this time around you learned a little bit more about how to achieve that compared to the first album? 
Absolutely. And I, I appreciate that you say it doesn't seem like I'm throwing things in people's faces. I do. Oh, totally. I try to be tactful, but sometimes I do feel like I'm spamming. But, you know, you got to... You got to you toe the line. It's tough. Yeah, it's very tough. Um, I would definitely say it was more intentional this time around. When I was releasing Nimue's Gift, I didn't know about the Facebook groups until after. Um, oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize anything about... Like, I didn't know there were Spotify playlists to even get on. Uh, or that that was a big deal um, when releasing Nimue's Gift. Um, and I, I guess for me, um, I am as you may be able to tell, really obsessed with both fantasy and music. Those are like the two biggest right. things yeah. in my life. I absolutely love them. And most of the other big decisions I make in my life are because of the aesthetics of those things, which is kind of, uh, you know, ridiculous to say out loud. But <laughs> here we are. Like the reason I like, you know, I'm, I'm big into fitness. That's something else I like a lot. And like, sure, it's yeah. good to be healthy and... um it's good to be healthy and live a long life and you know it's cool to be strong and they you know whatever look good and all that stuff but like really i'm lifting because it's like ah yeah like i want to look like some hero from, from you know, <laughs> it'll look like conan yeah conan or you know <laughs> some ranger I, I don't know yeah whatever yeah. it's it's absurd conan is a great example which i'm nowhere near looking like uh conan however <laughs> that that's kind of the root of where I draw a lot of these sure, decisions, yeah. you know, living in a stylized manner. Um, so I, I guess saying that it's like, you know, these are the, the two really central ideas to um, how I operate. And it's been my obsession for a long time to be able to, you know, draw my soul income from, um, from making music that's it's a goal that i you know i i hope to be able to do it within the next five years that's kind of how i'm approaching it and i'm trying to make all the yeah. decisions i can um and able to you know build up an income from music so that i can essentially quit the day job and say hey um i don't know this this is what i do for a living i'm gonna wake up in the morning i'm gonna you know go exercise and get off to a good start with the day and then i'm seeing what opportunities I have in the music field and let's tackle them and uh, do what makes me happy and what, you know, fills my heart with wonder and glee. And uh, in the process, hopefully I can make a little money too and, you know, be able to support myself. And so when I'm doing this marketing stuff, I take it very seriously because I don't want to do all this effort and waste really good potential progress towards this overarching goal I have. So I kind of just try to watch and see what other people are doing, dungeon synth and otherwise, to see how I can best leverage, um, you know, success in the genre and um, success otherwise, so that I'm building up a listener base and a fan base, and you know, kind of getting that ball rolling, so that it, without my direct input, it might still be gaining new listeners and followers, and. Um, yeah, really setting myself up for, you know, success in the future. I think one thing yeah. that's nice about Dungeon Synth is that, you know, other than Dungeon Synth, I'm big into heavy metal and jazz, like kind of technical music, um, which is really difficult. And the Dungeon Synth stuff I write is technical and complicated too, I would say. Um, but since I'm playing it on a keyboard, you know, I try to write and record everything and kind of do it live as much as I can. I'll hit record and I'll play stuff so that it sounds organic, but it's very easy to say, oh, well, that note's a little funny. Let's swap it out for a different one or mm. let's move that to a different instrument. Um, there's so many processes and tools within you know the digital recording space that allow you to rapidly prototype things, and you can get albums out a lot more quickly. Um, so really what I'm trying to do is like, I don't know, with the marketing side, make sure I'm hitting a big list of checkboxes uh, to make sure I'm getting the most out of each release and trying to release a little more frequently than I might be able to with other sort of more technical genres where you have to be able to play everything perfectly or it's yeah. not legit. Um, like with the metal stuff, you know, writing one song takes probably as long as writing three or four songs in Dungeon Synth. And sure. I put the same amount of, you know, dedication and effort and love into the Dungeon Synth tracks. It's just by nature of the medium, it is faster. It's and pure so, logistics, yeah. Yeah, so 
with that, it's like, oh, you know, I could probably, my goal is to release two albums in 2022, and we are currently on track to do so. Um, two Dungeon Synth albums, and then get a good chunk of another album or two written in this year as well, which is, again, I think we're on track to do so. Ah. Um, so I guess just from a marketing standpoint, it's like having things cooking in a few different, uh, like a, a few different dishes going, I guess, for dinner uh, at the same time, because, you know, you you might work more efficiently if, say, you've got four spots on the stove and you're cooking, you know, if you're just making one dish, you might be using two of them and the microwave and uh, the counter or like a third of the counter. But if you're cooking two or three dishes, you know, you can more <laughs> efficiently have all of the burners running and all of the counter space used. And sure, you might it might get a little messy, but well, I'm just kind of a uh, all over the place and sometimes messy person in general. So I'm not even I'm not even mad about that. But I love that. Uh, I guess I totally got off track here and wasn't really answering your question. I was just talking about things I was thinking about. So to better answer your question, I would say um, you're asking more about like what sort of strategies I was using, right, in marketing my dungeon synth? Yeah, maybe what, if not what specific strategies, kind of what you've learned along the way. And, uh, you know, you mentioned you, you kind of sit back and watch and see what works and doesn't. So I imagine that there's a lot more of that between Elevalon 1 and 2. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's played a role. For sure. I think, like, one thing I saw is that I think um, waiting too long in between releases, not good. But I also think that if you release too often, probably not good. Because people, you know, in one case, in the first case, they might forget about your stuff. Um, Or, you know, just, like, you've kind of lost a lot of your user listener base they're moving on to other things because the genre is constantly pumping out new stuff yeah Um, and then you know on the other side of it if you're pumping out so much stuff all the time people kind of get numb to it and what i found which i don't like um but this is just kind of how i am i really like to figure out an artist um when i listen to an artist like it's perfect for me if when i discover them they have two or three albums because then i can listen to them all and i'm like ah yeah i get them and they release a new thing and i'm like ah i can listen to that too and i still understand the totality of them But if I discover an artist and they already have, say, 10 releases, I'm kind of overwhelmed. And then they release two more albums. Yeah, it's imposing. And I'm like, I don't know if I can even figure this out. And if, you know, within a six month time frame, there are two new albums, um, then I'm like, wow, I just, I wasn't even caught up on the old stuff. And I (laughs) I don't even know what to think. And so for me, that's overwhelming. I can't even write that fast. Um, So that's not, probably not even a worry here. But yeah, I kind of saw that, you know, maybe getting one release per year to two releases per year seemed pretty smart. And the way it's going to shake out is it's going to be like, I think one release every like eight months or something uh, for Elevon. That's good. Yeah. That's pretty manageable. Yeah. And you know, with the electric medium and then having time for cassettes to be made and someday yeah. hopefully vinyl, you know, it, it it's seeming to work out well. Um, and then from there, I'm just trying to, you know, employ strategies I've used. I really liked what um, Evergreen Fog Weaver did uh, mm-hmm. with the new Hideous Confidious release, where they had a cool, like, little Twitch live stream. Yeah. Uh, where it was like, you know, it, it was great. There's the, you know, they're playing the intro songs, and you're not sure exactly what it is because it's a surprise release, and, um, you know, the lyrics, the little bit of poetry was coming up on the screen, and. You know, suddenly it hits and you're like, oh, this is, you know, hideous, confidious, I think it's number four. Um, and so I, I thought that was super fun. I had already made a trailer in the past, but that kind of was made me think like, wow, you know, I'm already writing all this poetry. It'd be fun to incorporate that. And, you know, just try and build up a little bit of hype or like get people talking about the album by releasing a single and actually putting it on Bandcamp and releasing it and getting people excited or, you know, trying to get some merch going. Um to get people thinking about El- Elevalon, even if it's not necessarily the album, they're just thinking about Elevalon. And then, you know, I might drop a little hint here and there in the publications I put out that, hey, yeah, or new album coming up, or nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and yeah. you know, here's a YouTube video, and um, here's a release date, and, you know, stuff like that. Um, just trying to keep it in people's mind, uh, minds and, you know, build up to that culmination, which is coming on Friday, I guess. Although, yeah, one other thing I found is that YouTube is just 
feels like a brick wall. Uh, it's it's so impossible to understand how it works. It's brutal. Um, yeah. So I I don't even know. You know, it's especially for dungeon synth. You you see all these really successful dungeon synth projects that have you know you would hope like it seems like they have thousands of potential followers and listeners on like Bandcamp and then like 50 on YouTube and yeah so I was just trying to come up with gimmicks to maybe get some some <laughs> some more subscribers on YouTube and I thought well hey maybe I'll release this album a couple days early just on YouTube and see if I can get some subscribers I think I got like 20 out of it so that's not too bad nice uh, yeah I, I wouldn't have thought of that and I as you did it, I thought, oh, that's a good approach, especially since you have a lot of YouTube content available. It uh, it makes sense. Like, uh, hey, you can listen to it early, but uh, it exposes you to all this other stuff I have. Maybe you'll check it out. Yeah, I thought it would be fun. I got messages from a few people um, who were like, ah, I finished the album and I loved it. And then it went on to this other thing and I loved that too. And I was like, hey, that's good. <laughs> Watch all my content. Consume content, yeah. please. <laughs> uh, which feels a little weird saying it but you know yeah. you gotta do what you gotta do i guess um i i thought about it's it for all... a while oh go ahead sorry uh it's, it's always funny how uh, like you'll put a lot of time into something and then i you'll feel like you've done so much to get it out there and it's so readily available maybe everything that you have is you know connected and, and the links or whatever and then you'll hear from someone that's uh listen to everything that you do in one sector and then they'll say, Oh, I had no idea about this other thing that you do. It's uh, the information's not as fluid as you think, like tying your different platforms together or uh, the yeah. different places that you're available. hundred percent. I think people just oftentimes don't want to seek it out. Even if they know it's there, they're just like, yeah, I like this thing, and, <laughs> you know, it, which is fine. Um, but yeah, I, I found kind of similar to that or adjacent to that. Um, between like all of my platforms you know i would say i would think i'd be able to um get the word out to like say maybe a thousand people right just between instagram followers and uh like Bandcamp followers and you know all the all the other places i have things uh, like the discord uh that we hang yeah. out on. um but really you know i put out this album and i was like yeah maybe we'll get you know if we get a third of that that would be wild if a third of those people were like hey my friend Elavalon released an album it's on his youtube page well let's go subscribe to his youtube channel like well you know i'm just it the conversion rate's very low um, <laughs> that's a great way to put it yeah which i you know i can see why it would be i guess when well i don't know when people i like post like hey i have a youtube channel and i just released this thing i'm always like ah heck yeah I want to see more of it, so I'm going to go subscribe. But I guess a lot of people don't operate like that. Um, yeah, different maybe. strokes. Yeah, exactly. So YouTube's brutal. Um, I'm trying to figure that out and releasing it a couple days early. I think it was pretty successful. But um, yeah, trying to really figure out other ways to, to market that and build that is going to be useful over over time, I guess. And that was part of my marketing strategy, which was of mixed mixed success here. So. Ah, I'm glad we dove into that, into talking about marketing. I feel like that's something that is so, it's so weird and it's so hard to talk about, but it's really interesting and it, like, you want to play it cool and say you don't care, but we all work so hard on our music, we want people to listen to it. It's not even often for any other gain besides that, but we all want people to listen to the thing we worked hard on, you know? Oh, absolutely. I... I'm definitely never going to play it cool here and say, I don't care. Right, I, yeah. I totally care. I want people to listen to it. Yeah. I, I worked super hard on this. This is like, this is me in audio form or a part of me. And uh, yeah, I want as many people to hear it as they can. And the thing is that, you know, when I show people uh, the stuff I've come up with, I very rarely get someone say, I hate it. This is bad. Or this doesn't sound good. Like it's rare that someone isn't like, yeah, this sounds nice um, at, at the very least. Or, you know, a lot of people love it. And so I just think like, if I can get people to click, I think they're going to like it. At least maybe half of them or maybe three fourths <laughs> of them. And, you know, yeah, totally. that sounds like good news for a musician. I think there are a lot of bands I love where I would think only 10% of 
people who listen to it would like it. And, <laughs> you know, they have tons and tons of followers and listeners and whatnot. And, you know, I don't want to compare myself and get envious and greedy and whatnot. But also I do want to do justice or I guess respect the, the music that I've made and try and get as many people who might like it to listen to it as possible. Yeah, and maybe more so because I I imagine for you deep down you know that you've you've really put all of your effort into it like you didn't uh it's not a half effort you uh you take your time and you do things as well as they need to be done before you let them go and uh I feel like you're aware of that and that even more so drives you to wanting people to get exposed to your things I mean absolutely yeah if there's even a, a small detail um in the release that I'm not happy with and it gets out it'll drive me crazy <laughs> like totally crazy so yeah yeah uh, the, the attention to details there and yeah I want people to hear it and I want people to like it and you know if enough people like it there's that allure for me and we're like yeah if really enough people like it and it starts to grow this can be your your your, your thing your gig um which is you know what I've always wanted so absolutely so yeah I guess that's why I take that marketing seriously sure so to uh, start to wrap things up, you can answer this in as much or as little depth or as mysteriously as you'd like, but what's next for, for Elvalon and for Tristan the Musician? I know you have other projects that you've been working on. You put out a single for a sludge metal album. Uh, at the end of our last interview, you said you had many ideas, but not a single note had been written for the next Elvalon. Is that the case here? Uh, yeah, what's next? At this point, I have many more ideas, and some of those notes have been written. So, okay. Progress, at the very least. Uh, yes, you mentioned uh, the single I released. Um, so Josh from Blade of Kino and I kind of teamed up, and uh, yeah, we wrote a, a like a fantasy post metal sludge metal sort of uh, single, which was super fun. I really had a blast doing that. Uh, you know, just writing bold like Conan esque fantasy lyrics yeah. about being uh unstoppable i guess, i don't know it's about giants and fun things and <laughs> battles and whatever fun imagery i had a blast doing it i did the the guitars and the well i did half the guitars so josh wrote it um like the structure of the song i kind of uh helped modify it a bit and then you know sent it back to him and he would modify it some more and you know we worked together to really embellish it and turn it into a full song and then I did half the guitars, he did half the guitars, I did the bass, and then I did the vocals. And um, yeah, so that was just a, a total blast. Um, we have every intention of doing a full album with that, um, because I love Dungeon Synth, and um, you know, uh, it's just been a huge part of my life these since I discovered it, and these past years since I've been... Uh, Almost wow! Hasn't even been a year since I released El Evalon One, which is wild. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that earlier today. It's coming up on a year, four months from now. So that's wow! It's still a chunk of time. But um, as much as I love Dungeon Synth, it is unlikely that I can just fully support myself with music using that. And I love heavy metal in many, many of its forms. Um, but one thing I learned, and this kind of goes back to the marketing thing, is that um. So I had that Bone Weaver project that I've, you know, mentioned in the yeah. past, which is like a sort of mix of so many different genres. There's, you know, melodic death metal influences and prog metal influences and post rock and uh like even like some post hardcore influences and punk influences and stuff and it's all over the place. It's very true to who I am and it, you know, it was the first full album I ever did. It's a little rough around the edges in places, but I love it. I'm super happy with it. But the thing is, it doesn't really fall into a niche where it's it. I feel like it fell between the cracks, right? A lot yeah. of people listen to it and they're like, "That's sweet." What even is it? Like, it's clearly metal, but you know, I totally know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Most veins of metal, if if it's like, say, you know, I don't know, stoner doom or uh, sludge metal or thrash metal or black metal black metal very specifically you know these have avenues with which communities form around them and when there's a new release it's easy to z for the community to kind of zone in and get a good look at it and a lot of people will just listen to it 
by virtue of it being that type of metal. There are a lot of fans who are like, I am a this metal fan and a this metal fan only, or I'm a fan of this type of metal and that type of metal, right? Um, mine was none of those, and so it kind of fell between the cracks, I feel. Um, and yeah, it, it really didn't pick up any steam, whereas with Elevlon, it's felt like it's picked up a ton of steam because it was clearly very dungeon synth. At least I like to think so. And yeah. the dungeon synth community was like, yeah, we like this. Um, or at least a good chunk of it was, I feel. Um, and so I kind of want to go back to metal um, with, you know, more of a, okay, this is going to fall into a subgenre. I'm still doing my thing where I pull in tons of influences, but I'm writing with some restraints right uh, i think a lot of creativity comes from writing with restraints and being like yeah we're going to write in this style and see where that takes us but it's clearly going to be sludge metal right um and i think metal is just so much of a larger genre than dungeon synth i love dungeon synth but yeah if i want to support myself fully i'm going to have to put out successful albums in other realms and so metal is going to be where i'm looking next um yeah i've got about half of the follow up bone weaver album done and that I have, you know, I'm I'm definitely going to be zeroing in on some different subgenres of metal. And then of course the Barrow King thing, which is going to be super fun. Um I'm super super excited about how the single turned out and it'll be fun to shop that to record labels once the album's done and you know really get a um like a true fuzzy huge mix and you know good fantasy lyrics. I think it'll be a, a total blast. So and likely you know if i if i really do it right i think there's potential for it to go places so um that's definitely what's up next for me as a musician um focusing on those two things um i've kind of hinted at it in the past and i think at this point uh i'm just going to bring it out in the open because i am terrible Ooh. at keeping secrets with uh you know what i'm doing i've probably sent demos to like yeah i don't know five people or something and you know it's just easier to talk about i don't think anyone I don't. I don't think anyone's going to be able to pull, rip off the the Elevalon idea here. Um, at least you know if they if they do it, it it'll, it'll be great. But it's not going to sound like Elevalon. Um, I'm making a Christmas album. Yes. I'm not, I'm not going to bring in all the detail of what that entails because sure. there's, um, I would say, both sonically and uh, stylistically or conceptually. Um, there's a lot more to it than just that. Um, but the idea stemmed from it being, a, it's, it's a Christmas inspired album, maybe, or a winter, I don't know. Um, Christmas inspired album, I think is the way to say it. That's going to come out on, I'm thinking Black Friday, and I want it to drop with text. <laughs> so that, that's great. I wrote about half of it, um, in the last, like, Christmas, you know, holiday season. Um, and that actually, I wrote a lot of it before I wrote any of the troll stuff. Um, and so, yeah, that I, I, I'm going to finish that. Um, I've also been working with, so a sludge metal band reached out to me and said, Hey, Elevalon, uh, we would like for you to write some Elevalon tracks and be featured on our sludge metal album, which I said yes to. They sound awesome. Um, really excited about that. And so I'm gonna write. I'm gonna be writing four tracks for them. Two of them are gonna be interludes, and then a new foray for Elevlon. I'm gonna be writing synth parts for full band tracks for two tracks. Which oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that I'm a little nervous about that, but I I have a good concept of what I want to do, and I I want it to sound again true to the Elevlon sound, but you know also play its part well. So. Wow, so Christmas album on the horizon is is so exciting. I'm uh I remember quite a while ago you telling me a handful of of ideas that you had that you hadn't uh started writing for yet and thinking like, "Oh, I want to hear the Christmas one get realized so bad. I'm so excited to see uh how, how that ends up." Uh that's great news. Yeah, I'm I'm it's it's gonna happen. The album cover's been done for a while. Um, oh no way! Yeah, when an album cover's done for me, that means it's it's real and it has to happen. Yeah. Um, so that yeah, that album cover's been done for a while. I'm really happy with uh, what I was able to pull together there. Um, yeah. Other than that, I have 
a bunch of ideas for Elevalon albums in the future. Yeah. Uh, there's a Tolkien album. I won't tell, you know, necessarily what the what the idea sure. is, but it has a very very specific sonic identity behind it that I have not written a single note of yet. But um, I think the uh, commission for the artwork is already outstanding. I know exactly. Oh wow. Where I'm going with that. It's kind of a full idea in my head, and I'm excited to go there. And I think it's Tolkien, as Tolkien has not been done before in the Dungeon Synth community, which... It's Tolkien a bold has been, statement. It is very bold. <laughs> if I may be so bold, that's what I'm saying. I think it's been done a lot, but this take on Tolkien I don't think has been done, and I wouldn't be making this if I didn't think it wasn't still unique and fresh. So there's going to be that one. Um, and I, I have some, uh, some more refined... Uh, maybe Renaissance at level on as well, or maybe even Concert of Europe at level on in wow. mind. Monte Cristo and uh, you know various other, I guess Rococo design and I don't know things like that. Very um, uh, maybe borderline extravagant and reposed uh, or composed. I don't know uh, something more. Elegant and uh, refined, I guess. Uh, I have that in mind too. So there, there's there's a lot in store for Elevalon. I don't think I'm going to be slowing. You know, the only thing that's going to slow me down is if I run out of ideas that I think um, I would like to sonically achieve. But with all these ideas, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you're full of full of sonic palettes to pick from, full of ideas and concepts. I try to be. Um, nice well yeah it seems like there's a ton to keep an eye out for uh i guess as we really start to wrap things up here uh, what uh obviously you've got the new album that's why we're here but more specifically what would you like to plug you mind throwing your band camp your your social media absolutely well yeah first and foremost like you said drums in the deep wood coming out it's already out on youtube you can listen to it uh but it'll also be out on Bandcamp and uh, Spotify and all other streaming on Friday. Super excited about it. Please listen to it. If you listen to it, send me a message. Tell me what you think. I would absolutely love to hear it. I have an open invitation um, for you to you know, tell me as much as you like about this and that and ask me how I did it. I'm more than happy to share. So there's that. Um, and to reach out to me, you can find me in a few places. Uh, Instagram is a good one. It's going to be elevalon underscore. To be honest... I have no memory of why I put an underscore there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, E-L-Y-V-I-L-O-N underscore is my handle there. Um, so you can follow me there and send me messages. I will respond. Uh, other than that, uh, Bandcamp, same thing, elevalon.bandcamp.com. You'll find a uh, fresh new graphic design update to my Bandcamp Ooh. page for the Drums in the Deepwood album featuring some incredible art. Uh, that's been a little bit modified, uh, but some uh, John Bauer art that I messed with to kind of fit the uh, fit the vibe. Super happy about how that turned out. And um, other than that, you can also find me on Melkor's DS Dungeon, which is everyone's favorite dungeon synth hangout spot. Um, I think both Trev and I have links to that somewhere on our social media pages. So if you absolutely if you don't have an invite to that. Uh, reach out and we can get you one um i i'll throw one on the bottom of the youtube for this as well sounds great to me uh i definitely think that is the premier place for dungeon synth hangouts and discussion (laughs) and i don't know dungeon synth adjacent discussion and culture and all that stuff great group of people yeah uh, tons of fun and you know so much of this album is you know just derived from conversations i had uh with folks on there or you know little marketing ideas i got from there um great group of people and if you want to network in the dungeons and scene there are some great people to talk to on there uh yeah other than that i've got a little bit of merch on my band camp uh or at least some of it's coming soon i've got a couple t-shirts left i think i've got three or four of the original run of elvalon t-shirts they're nice fitted perfect tees by haynes or something like that uh, a good olive green with a harp on the back. Super fun. Um, would highly recommend them if you're a small or an extra large. We've got a couple we need to move. And uh, <laughs> if you reach out to me, I'm sure I'll give you a deal on it. Um, other than that, some Elevalon hoodies have been uh, showing up at people's 
doorsteps lately this week. I've been shipping out a lot of those. I've heard they raise your charisma by a whopping seven points. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you want one, feel free to reach out to me or they'll be up on my Bandcamp once the pre-order run has sold out and I see how many extra I have. Um, wow, that was a lot of plugging, but I think that's all of it. Ah, I think it's that's all good. All and uh, I can back you up. My hoodie came in earlier today. Uh, my charisma's through the roof. It's great. <laughs> All right, <laughs> honest review. What do you think from the? No, nah, honest know, review. It's great. I got the cream, and uh, I don't feel like I have a lot of cream hoodies, and that's much appreciated. Uh, it's it's. I don't know the words to describe the texture. It's not normal hoodie texture. It's very comfortable. I like it. So yeah, those I'd say it's kind of a peachy cream, almost a tan. Yeah, something sorta. like that. Yeah, with a black um, drawing on the back. It's got like a a cool knight with armor fighting a giant who's like crashed a big, huge uh, like crack in the ground with a club. <laughs> Wild stuff, but um, it's very dungeon yeah. synth. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited about that one. Um, but yeah, I sprung for the top of the line hoodies on that one. Um, thanks to the you know, the pre-orders, we were able to say, hey, I'm going to be able to sell this number. And I can afford to do the Bella Plus Canvas, which are like these, I think they're like Californian made or something um, hoodies, but they're ultra soft, um, both on the outside and the inside. And they've got, you know, kind of a thicker um, knit to it. Uh, like the threads are pretty thick and I don't know, it feels very premium. So I'm super happy with how they turned out as well. And if you want one, they're there. I think that's all I've got for plugging. That was, uh, that was a, a, <laughs> a little bit indulgent, but that's totally fine. It's uh, we're like got to be like two hours in or something. Anyway, who's here? Yeah, it looks like an hour forty-two. Wow. Uh, nice. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I really appreciate you coming on again and talking. I'm sure the fans are clamoring to hear <laughs> uh, about all the juicy details behind the album, and and. I know I've told you this a bunch, but it's genuinely so good. The uh, it, the album has been enjoyable to listen to. It's had uh, an impact on me as a musician. Uh, j- just from listening and doing a casual analysis to it, it's it's great. It's so good. If you're not listening to it, uh, you got to change that. You got to go listen. I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I'm sure, but... um. Hearing a, an artist you respect and, you know, someone who makes music that you really enjoy say that your music has influenced them, one of the best compliments a, a musician can ever receive. So I really appreciate that. Thanks, Trevor. That's too kind. Of course. All right. Well, I guess with this, we'll get out of here. Uh, yeah. Thanks again so much for coming on and talking. It's been super fun. It's nice to have you. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Thanks for having me on. And I hope you find grandeur and glory on the uh, path of your questing soul, Trev. I'll, uh, talk to you Hell soon. yeah. All right. Take care. Bye. See ya. All right. Sup, friends. I hope you enjoyed all that wonderful talk from Ella Valon. It is absolutely a treat to get to pick into something that's so carefully and deliberately created. And it's so nice to hear... Uh, not just the technical, but also a lot of the conceptual thought process behind making it. There's really so many juicy details that uh, that are behind the new project, and I'm so glad to have gotten to uh, take a look into them here. So if you haven't listened to the new album, Drums in the Deep Wood, then you've absolutely got to go check it out. I, uh, I waited until the day after the full release to publish this app, so it's on their Bandcamp, it's on their YouTube, and it's also on all the places that you'd normally stream music, so Spotify, Apple Music, all of that. Um, I'll throw all their links in the description of this YouTube video, uh, but also if you just go to wherever you listen to music and search Elevalon, then I'm, I'm sure you're gonna find it. And then also aside from Elevalon, Tristan works on, as we mentioned, the solo project Bone Weaver, and he's also part of the sludge metal project Barrow King, which also features Josh from Blade of Kino, who's a, a friend of mine that's been on the show before. Yeah, definitely go check those out as well. They're they're both really fun, great projects, and they're available on all the normal uh, music spots as well. Uh, in Trev news, as always, you can listen to the other episodes of this podcast as well as to my music under Cursebin on YouTube or uh, Bandcamp or wherever you'd stream podcast and music. So again, places like Spotify, 
Apple Music, Apple Podcasts, all of those. I also have both Curse Bitten and Cast Bitten merch. Uh, that's over at cursebitten.bandcamp.com slash merch. And uh, if you want to keep up with myself and with my projects, you can check out cursebitten underscore on Instagram. And uh, one last thing before I go, I just want to say thanks so much to everyone who bought North Order tapes, uh, either over from Vicious Mockery Records or uh, through the distribution from Realm and Ritual. They're, uh, they're totally sold out. They sold out really quick. And uh, that's just so cool. That's incredible. And I, I couldn't be more appreciative of that. I'm so thankful to all the fans that uh, that went out and, and got tapes, and I, I really hope you enjoy them and just appreciate the support so much. So yeah, huge thanks to all of those people. All right, I think I'm going to get out of here. Thanks again to Tristan for coming on and talking, giving us all the juicy deets on his new release. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone who listened. All right, take care, everyone. Get out of here. <laughs>